Well, welcome to Round the Table Live with Christian Concern, and my name is Tim Diep, and we're discussing today global Anglicanism, and in particular the GAFCON conference, which finished just uh, last week, which issued a very powerful statement, um, highly critical of the Church of England. And I'm delighted that today we've got the Reverend Andrew Symes um, joining us, who was in Kigali last week at the GAFCON conference and was heavily involved in it. Thank you so much for joining us, Andrew. Um, and also Andrea Williams, um, who has been to Gafcon previous, in previous years and um, is, has been a member of General Synod as well and is obviously very interested in all things Anglican. So, Andrew, um, you, you came back from Rwanda just last week. Um, tell us what is Gafcon? How did it come about? What is it? Who does it represent? Just give us a bit of a background um, for us before we get into this particular conference. Yeah, I think thanks for um, inviting me on the show. Um, I think the first thing to say is that this is really important, even if you're not Anglican. Uh, the Anglican Church is um, one of the biggest Christian denominations, over 100 million affiliates, and it's been one of the main vehicles of the gospel in many parts of the world, and it continues to grow um, with its combination of history and liturgy, but also the way it adapts to local cultures and also to new trends in Christian life and mission. Um, but I guess like other big churches, uh, there are divisions about its beliefs and its strategy, especially in the face of what's happening in the West with the new ideologies um, coming through in the West. So just a brief history of GAFCON, and it started in 2008, um, uh, mainly because many Anglicans around the world couldn't, uh, felt they couldn't attend the Lambeth Conference, which is the big conference of bishops from around the world invited by the Archbishop of Canterbury, they felt they couldn't come because of the failure of the American Anglican Church to repent for consecrating uh, a man who was uh, in a same-sex relationship as bishop. And also they introduced same-sex blessings around that time. Uh, but the roots go back even further to constant warnings by uh, global leaders, particularly from the Global South, uh, about liberal theology and uh, the unchecked uh, influence of secular thinking in in, uh, in Western churches. So anyway, this conference, Ben, it started in 2008, and the idea was to ha have it every five years. And the intention was always to be not just a conference, but a movement for mission uh, and fuel along biblical lines. Um, so it's a fantastic thing. It's generally multiracial uh, from people from all around the world. Um, and it's always included not just bishops and archbishops, but clergy and lay people. Uh, who want who, who buy into the vision and uh, from from pl places all around the world where the Anglican Church has, has flourished. And um, the the conference in Kigali last week there was like one thousand three hundred and two delegates, fifty two countries, which is an incredible number of countries, um, three hundred and fifteen bishops, and four hundred fifty six other clergy there, and like and another five hundred plus laity as well. Well, how many, you know, people say this represents 85% of the global Anglican community. Is that, is that right? Is that how you read it? Well, well, yes. I mean, the, the, um, many, part, the, many parts of the world have Anglican, an Anglican presence, which is much bigger in, in their society than we have here. Uh, even though we have the Church of England and a church in every, in every sort of village and every, every community, the, the actual numbers who go, as we know, is declining. And the influence is declining, whereas in many other parts of the world, uh, the Anglican Church has grown uh, exponentially, um, uh, and uh, you know in all all parts of the world. So um, it, it is it is a major a, a major thing. I mean, some of the countries only sent sort of two or three representatives, and some some sent hundreds. So um, you know, that that was how we got the those numbers. Um, yes, I think because I think it's one of the sort of mistakes that people generally make especially in the west but particularly in england they think that anglicanism is the church of england mm. and there is a sense in which because of the way in which um the archbishop of canterbury historically has been considered amongst the bishops um the first among equals and the way in which canterbury has been seen as um at, well with, rightly, with all the significance imbued uh, with regard to Anglicanism and many people coming to Canterbury to gather to Canterbury and to London, it has this massive 
um, dis in a sense, well, disproportionate um, impact in t uh, compared to the sheer number of Anglicans that there are across the world. And of course, if you were, I wasn't at Kigali, but you know what? I kind of felt that I was at Kigali because I was following what was going on and the vibrancy. And Andrea, of... you've been to Gafgon conferences previously, haven't you? Yes, and I think that when you go, when when I was at, I was at Nairobi, I've been um, also at Jerusalem, but when you actually go there um, and see archbishops absolutely loving King Jesus, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, unashamed, unabashed in full out worship um, and in full out worship to, to all the people that are there and beyond in terms of what they're doing at the particular time, um, you see a very different face um, of Anglicanism. And so I think that it's true to say that it's something like eight, it represents, GAFCON represents some over 80 million, uh, doesn't it? Um, of people across the world. And this is really, um, and the fact that it exists, because in the West we have departed hmm. it, it, from true Anglicanism, because true Anglicanism um, really loves the gospel. True yeah. Anglicanism is an outworking of how to build structures and church and a, and gospel accountability true anglicanism that's what it, it is in, endeavoring to do yeah. and that in a sense is why our society why why british society mm. why because we have mm. cared about it and invoked it right at the heart of our institutions so yeah. it's true the, the church in every village but it, anglican schools anglican assemblies prayers bishops in the house of lords all of these things, prayers in a, a, a service of commitment for our judges, for the judiciary, all of these things are in our public life. Why? Because historically we cared about Christ and the way in which we did this as the United Kingdom was an outworking through our through Anglicanism. Yeah. And of course, then because that that and the missionary spread across the world, spread across the world. And the fruits are in those that are still pursuing true Christianity in the global south and beyond in a real yeah. way and its vibrancy in life is there. And this is why it is an absolute tragedy yeah. that, that the West has departed, Canterbury has departed from the from the true faith. And that's why these that's that's why the statement that comes out of Kigali and I know Andrew's going to Well, speak well let's about go on that. But um but Andrew, I wanted to ask you how many people you were you were in the British delegation. How many people went from the British delegation and how many bishops from were in the British delegation? Uh there were about 120, 130 people from Britain and maybe maybe 20 from, from Ireland. Um uh -huh. Quite a lot. And uh, that, uh, it, there were some from mainland Europe as well, a sm small number of Anglicans from mainland Europe, but uh, but uh, probably over probably half or over half that group, more than half that group were from the Church of England. Yeah. Uh, there were um, a couple of retired bishops and one serving bishop, uh, who, Rob Munro, who's taken over from from Rod Thomas um, uh, as the right. bishop. Uh, yeah, who, who who deals with who looks after churches who who um don't accept women uh women's um ordination bishops and and uh but um yeah so um small number of of, of bishops retired and, and and current um but i mean this has happened in the past as well and and, and one of the issues with gafcon is that uh, in the original jerusalem declaration um, which is really a declaration about what Anglicans believe, about what the gospel is, what, what we believe about the Bible and so on, in a very basically orthodox Christian way. But it does have one item in it um, which says we, we reject the authority of leaders who have departed from the, the biblical faith. Right. And we call upon them to repent and, and return to the Lord. So that's been there since 2008. And that's why bishops in the Church of England, even if they are privately sympathetic to, um, to a, if you like, an evangelical, orthodox, orthodox, biblical view of what Anglican should be, 
they can't they can't sign that because it would mean that they they reject the authority of some of their fellow bishops. Um, so um, that has been a sort of bone of contention for why some haven't come. But right. it, it, it's it's um, I mean it's it, it's really what what has just happened in in Kigali is an outworking of that which they've been saying clearly since two thousand and eight. This isn't something that suddenly happened. Right. Uh, that that if if um, if our leaders, if church leaders openly depart from the clear teaching of scripture, they forfeit their authority. And then yes. uh, faithful Christians then have to decide what to do. And, and they have yes. to move away from them and separate from them. And, and yes. that's that's what's happened here. So, I want to, um, Andrew, I want to get on to the equipment um, yeah. in just a minute. But just before we do, I'm interested to know what the atmosphere was like there. What you know, There's all these people from 52 nations. Um, I don't know if we've got any pictures we can show um on online about this but you know pictures are available there's one um you know look how multi-ethnic that is and um and the numbers of people you get an impression there from that what what was the atmosphere like and how did you overcome all the language barriers and so on and how did you worship and uh, with all these different um, well I mean, it's, in, it's, in, it's all done in english uh, it's interesting right. actually rwanda was formerly a, a belgian <laughs> colony and then a, and then a french-speaking colony uh, and they have since the since the sort of rebuilding of the nation, they have very much embraced English as the as the sort of medium of instruction and, and right. sort of uh, the, the the kind of lingua franca. But but as you know, obviously Anglicanism does have English as the main language, so everything was in English. It was more difficult for people from non English speaking countries, particularly from South America and from Francophone Africa, uh, and so there had to be translation and. Uh, um, there had to be translation into Spanish, Portuguese, and French, and and, uh, and Swahili as well for some people from Tanzania, uh, whose English isn't so good. So that was all going on in the background, uh, and they were the ones who, um, yes, who, who. But but you know, otherwise it was in English, and and most people who, who were there speak good English, and so um, worship and and um, discussions and talks all happened in English. Can I just say, um, Andrew, on that on that point, really of. Gafcon, this is not this is not come out of nowhere. I mean, there were issues back, um, as 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 Andrew says, back in two thousand and eight. But for me, this has gone really, really slowly. I mean, I've been around since I predate two thousand and eight. Obviously, <laughs> I, I was, you know, I I, I was qualified in nineteen eighty eight as a barrister. So really, just coming into ad, adulthood and to into my career at, at that particular time, but really watching and involved in these things since that time. And the lack of clarity from, I'm going to speak about from the Church of England on many issues, on marriage, on beginning of life matters, on family structures, even in the 1990s was there for all to see, but actually not speaking clearly in, um, in 2004, for instance, on civil partnerships, not speaking clearly um, or, uh, around experimentation on embryos in 1990, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act, the restructuring of families, not speaking clearly on sexual orientation regulations and the Equality Act and these matters were all things that the Church of England, that bishops in the House of Lords might have taken a clearer position on. We also had the whole debate around women's bishops um, in, in within the general synod of the Church of England. And I hoped when I was there in the Church of England to have seen some really strong and amazing theological debate around that, theological debate, where I might have learned and sat at the feet of people who were theologically trained in order to learn, in order to really hear the arguments across both sides. And the truth was this, those debates in the General Synod of the Church of England were entirely conducted around Equality Act <laughs> principles and feelings and stories and not around true and hard and forensic theological debate. I knew then that in a sense, after that, the debate around same-sex marriages was going to come around marriage itself, the very nature of marriage was going to be done in a similar vein to the way in which the debate around women's bishops and church structure had been conducted. That's what I forecast. And indeed, that is what, what then, then happened. And really early on, I mean, in 2013, it's 10 years exactly since the Archbishop of Canterbury was installed. 
And his first test really in public life was that same year in the House of Lords when the bishops were being asked to stand on marriage. And in his speech in the House of Lords, he made clear that same-sex relationships should be recognised uh, with as much dignity and the same legal effect, those are his exact words, um, as marriage. So whilst we go to the gates at that time, but I think the impact of that, I'm saying that's 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things I lament, one of the things yep. I genuinely lament, um, is the fact that we, kind of British Anglicans, um, we've been slow, I'm not, we've been slow in getting to this point. We have been slow in 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 challenging errant bishops. Bishop, I mean, we we have bishops that are are have gone out directly contrary to the word of God in the past ten years, and they have not been disciplined. They've not been thrown out. But this has actually led well, not just um, to the nation astray. Yeah, no, that, that's all um, very helpful background, Andrea, and and of course the immediate background is the vote in synod in was it january just um to approve same-sex blessings blessings of same-sex relationships um which was 90 percent approved by the bishops and i think um more like 60 percent in the clergy and 50 percent in the in the laity um and then then we have this um kigali commitment the big statement that's come out from the conference now andrew i understand you were on the um drafting committee for this um, statement. Tell us about it, because it's very strong and what it, some of what it says there. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing to say about it is the, the process was really interesting and really democratic, one could say. You know, sometimes you go to conferences, especially big, big kind of international ones you hear about with the UN and so on, where essentially uh, um, the, the statement has been pre-written you know, basically, and it's all been agreed beforehand and the, the conference is really just just a sort of uh, window dressing uh, yeah. and it's not emerging from, whereas this genuinely does emerge from from the talks that are given at the conference and from a, a series of uh, feedback loops where people have a chance to comment uh, at not, uh, you know, at all levels of the conference, um, in you know, uh, individually and also in their regional groups. Um, and uh, that means that you know, as the statement group, we had to we had to filter through, you know, I I I reckon it was a, around a thousand different comments over the period of of the of the week, you know, the few days wow. we were together, going through and saying, is this something we can put in? Is it is it not? You know, is it how, how many people want this? And then how do we phrase it? So um, you know, it was a, something that took many many hours in the background, but it was a great privilege to be there. And um, yes, and 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 so. It really, it really can be said to emerge from the mind of the faith. Well, Andrew, I noticed, for example, because the reports are that that um, you were doing Bible studies on Colossians through the week. I understand, is that right? Yeah, and that's then, right. And then the statement says quotes from Colossians, doesn't it? And says that the Church of England is accepting hollow and deceptive philosophies, but, uh, you know, deliberate reference. I assume that came out of the conference studies. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, the, 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 the... Let me just read it. Some of them have been taken captive by hollow and deceptive philosophies of this world, Colossians 2.8. Yes, that, that's right. I mean, you know, there was very much a positive um, teaching on, on Colossians, you know, the uh, talking about the supremacy of Jesus Christ over the whole of creation of church and of life and death, the gospel of reconciliation through the cross, the... Pro, uh, uh, um, the, the need for repentance and faith and renewal and the need for the church to go out in, in mission uh, and also the, the, the place of, compa- of kindness and, and compassion, um, the place of repentance for, for us, for the church. So that's all the positive stuff. But, but obviously Colossians does talk about false teaching and um, as people are t- taken captive by these philosophies. And, you know, I think that's that's a really important thing as we as we see it in the context of this this specific event in the Church of England, because people's memories are very short. And sometimes people can think we're only responding to one incident that happened in a in a governing body of a church in February. Actually, as Andrea says, this has been going on for ages. And it, it it's not just a, a, a theological issue within the church. This is about whether we as Christians are going to be faithful to Christ in the face of a very powerful 
ideological takeover of our culture, which obviously Christian concern is, is dealing with all the time. I mean, you're dealing with the effects of that. And we need to name that. We need to say what it is. We need to and we need to stand firm against it and, and together. We can't do it individually. We have to do it together. Um, and it's not just us who are facing this, as we as we heard many times when we were there, that um, countries around the world are are facing this kind of new colonialism of West rich Western countries trying to impose um, these these teachings on them as well, on, you know, um, undermining their their family life and and uh, and their education and that kind of thing. So um, it, this isn't just a churchy issue, a theological issue within the church. This is. This is a major issue which is affecting us all um, across across the world in terms of how we see how we see life um, and Indeed, what is best way to flourish. And because we have allowed we've we've allowed the LGBT agenda, the political agenda, into our church. We've allowed it to dominate the discourse over the past uh, two quinquennium of the General Synod. The whole of the living and love and faith report, that process that the Church of England has been under, they, the bishops have still been unable to really say and proclaim what the marriage is between them, the lifelong union. They don't, they don't believe it, Andrea. They don't believe it. And those who do believe it uh, are being told, no, you, we've got to basically line up with what the culture is saying, otherwise we'll lose our place. And of course, that's entirely wrong. So when the culture has so invaded the church and those that are misleading the church are not disciplined and in fact thrown out, because that's what the Bible would require. That's what godly discipline would require so that the church might flourish in love. That would be a loving act, because actually what we want is we want our bishops to be in heaven. <laughs> we want those that lead us to be in heaven. And if they stray from the church, then that is very, very, if they stray from gospel teaching, that's very dangerous. Mm. But it's also not not just dangerous for the church, it's dangerous for the whole of our society. And I and, and of course we see, we're told in 2 Chronicles 14 that it's the people of God that have to repent um, and turn from our wicked ways that the nation might flourish. And there's a sense and we can, we see that very plainly with the church that's been within England. Let me just get into a bit more what the actual statement says here, because yeah. I think it's quite important. Because um, you know, in reference to the blessing of the proposed blessing of same-sex relationships, there's this sentence: "It grieves the Holy Spirit and us that the leadership of the church is determined to bless sin." Um, and then it just says, "Since the Lord does not bless same-sex union, it is pastorally deceptive and blasphemous to craft prayers that invoke blessings in the name of the Father." the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is a very strong wording, Andrew. Is there any objection to this strong wording in the discussions there in GAFCON? Blasphemous, blessing sin, etc. cetera. Um, well, what was interesting was at the beginning, I think there were people who were nervous, um, particularly from the Church of England delegation, but, but others as well who were nervous um, about, about that kind of language and about um, being critical at all in some cases of the Archbishop of Canterbury and what if, what what the sort of implications of that would be. Um, but as the as the week went on, um, those objections seemed to kind of disappear as people actually, I think, hearing from 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 others around the world and and, and people saying, you know, really, this is just so shocking to us, and how this is affecting us, particularly countries that are impacted by Islam. You know, you, you think of places like Nigeria and Kenya, um, you know, uh, other other places as well, um, you know, where where uh, this is a serious matter, um, uh, where if, if, if Christian churches are associated with um, practices that well like that, um, it, it, you know, then it's 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 a very it's very, very bad for Christian witness. So um, I think people, for a number of reasons, came over to the fact that actually, yes, this is actually right. It, it is. It is blasphem blasphemous. It is um, pastoral deceptive. And then what it goes on to say, just to read the next bit as well, Andrew, public statements by the Archbishop of Canterbury 
and other leaders of the church feeling that in support of same sex blessings are a betrayal of their ordination and consecration vows to banish error and to uphold and defend the truth taught in scripture. Hmm. That's yeah, also very uh, strong. Again, again, I think at the beginning there were some people who were wanting to say, well, it hasn't happened yet. You know, we've we, we've got to wait till July, until the July Synod and the, the prayers have we haven't seen the prayers yet, and uh, there's still a debate to be had. Um, but actually, I think most people accept that um, whatever the sort of uh, nuances of that, the Archbishop of Canterbury and York very clearly and publicly welcomed uh, prayers for the blessing of same-sex couples and, yeah. and um, very clearly welcomed the whole, the whole agenda, basically. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they're on record as doing so. So I don't think, you know, we can get away with that. I think you know obviously well, it would be interesting to see what still happens in synod uh, and this isn't this as i say this isn't a one off thing that suddenly come out of the blue this is a symptom one of many many symptoms over the years as andrea has said of an institution that that has that has gone uh, uh, you know it's 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 left its christian foundations and it's just embraced um the sort of um mm. beliefs I of, of the world well, I think what's very tragic about that, of course, is that there are many faithful Anglicans in this country and faithful Anglican ministers up and down the country faithfully working at a local level that love the Lord Jesus. But institutionally, what has happened is that the church institutionally and what the institutions look to in terms of defining Christianity for them, institutionally, the church is a poor reflection of the world mm. and has not been distinctive and has not done its job in being the prophet and the priest to the king to the government mm, mm. and that and that has and that is and that has massive ramifications um so let, let me just read one more um um very powerful statement in this in this longer um statement here we have no confidence that the archbishop of canterbury nor the other instruments of the community led by him lamb of confidence and can constitution council primary reasons I would find a godly way forward that will be acceptable to those who are committed to the truthfulness, clarity, sufficient authority of Scripture. So we have failed to maintain true communion based on the word of God and the shared faith in Christ. And then it goes on to say, um, successive Archbishops of Canterbury, this goes back in the history, doesn't it? So it's not just Welby. Successive Archbishops of Canterbury have failed to guard the faith by inviting bishops to Lambeth who have embraced or promoted practices contrary to Scripture. This failure of church discipline has been compounded by the current Archbishop of Canterbury who has himself welcomed the provision of liturgical resources to bless these practices contrary to scripture. This renders his leadership role in the young community entirely indefensible. So the question then for Andrew, where does this leave Archbishop Welby? And, and then maybe we can come on to how he's responded to this. Um, I mean, I guess that there are two related questions. One is Archbishop Welby himself, uh, and one is the institution of the Church of England, which which yeah. Andrew talked about. I mean, I think, in some ways, Archbishop Welby is a tragic figure, uh, and we need to continue to pray for him. Um, he he's tried to, he I think he sees his role and he sees the gospel in some way as a as a way of bridging between people with different opinions. Um, and and um, that's what he's tried to do. But actually, that's that's not what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to bridge the divide between the Pharisees and the Zealots. He, he came to announce the kingdom of God and, and, and we need to, to repent and uh, we all need to repent. So, I, you know, I think I think he's got it fundamentally wrong. And um, this is the result. I think we're going to see uh, we're going to see increasingly uh, the isolation of the Church of England, um, uh, the, the Church of England trying to be a, a reconciler between the secular world and faithful Christian belief, is going to end up being distanced from both. Um, you know, it's it, it, it's not succeeded, and obviously, so um, I think in terms of the Church of England um, and what will happen now. Um, you probably saw the statement that the Church of England had brought brought out immediately after the Kigali commitment. It looked like a pre-prepared thing, saying nothing to see here. Um, 
Can I just um, interrupt you a minute? So we've got a comment from Naomi on YouTube saying, I want to know what Justin Welby's response is. I saw a clip where he said, the differences are small. Surely they're huge. Has he changed his mind? Yeah, we can Sorry. we can probably put pop up pop up in the chat the Lambeth Palace statement on this. But Andrew is is absolutely right. It was uh, it was a, a way of entirely trying to um, diffuse the situation to essentially say there's nothing much to see. There's nothing much to see here. We've known of these differences. The bit that they got right is we've known that there are these issues. Uh, we carry on. We're going to just keep on talking. Um, yeah. That's what we're doing. We're going to keep on talking. Um, but of course, but. And in a sense, I'm sure that the kind of media and PR strategy of Lambeth was to to keep Gathcon entirely on the lowdown, um, because because what it does is it shines an, a light into the darkness, the light of truth that exposes all that Andrew has just said with regard to the isolation of the Church of England, how it is indeed out of step with global Anglicanism, how the Archbishop and the bishops are out of step with the bishops and the archbishops across the globe. How um, that 80% and those that lead the 80% are saying, we're dying to Christ. We're good. When we've got people being slaughtered in our nation uh, as a result of Islam, and when you're trying to fo foist what is blasphemous upon us and there are repercussions for that, we reject it. I mean, these are the messages that were coming out of GAFCON. And essentially what the, the PR machine has done is just absolutely quell that here. But let me say that part of the reason why it's been able to be quelled is because the church itself, the people of God, and now I'm not speaking about Anglicans, I'm speaking about the true bride. It is, there's a sense in which we have become, we have been silenced. The public in general, the institutions, the, the media, they know they don't understand it. They cannot understand the difference even. And this is because the gospel witness has so faded as a result of the fact that we departed, the, 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 stru the church structures departed. This glorious position to speak truth, instead we embraced the world. Christ got diminished. Christ, the message of Christ got confused. He got relegated to being a self-help therapist or we like your nice bits please do some pastoral work over here don't bring transformation don't bring uh, repentance don't bring the true gospel of jesus christ into public keep it all just be social workers be good do gooders so when I so what i want to ask andrew is um you know what sounds like an amazing conference and a, a, and a really powerful strong statement from gafcon but as Andrea is sort of saying that the, the Church of England and, and you know, the Church generally have managed to ignore it or pretty much ignore it, it's not been reported very widely, is it going to make any difference? What, what, what difference does it make and what, what are the implications of it going forward from here? Well, I think, um, I think it's, going to con con it's going to add to, the, uh, to the, um, the questions that are already starting to get louder uh, with the coronation coming up about the role of the Church of England in the constitution of this country, as well as its historic leadership of the Anglican Communion. Um, there'll be pressure exerted on overseas churches not to follow through. Um, I think lots of African provinces, for example, are have close connections, you know, decades old links with the Church of England, which involve financial support. And sometimes that's hinted at and sometimes that's explicit, those kind of threats. Um, uh, and so what we're seeing is not a sudden break. Do we suddenly break now or not? This is part of a slow unraveling. 20 years ago, the phrase was used with the, uh, with this sort of, with the crisis in the American Anglican Church. The phrase was used, if you do this, uh, you will tear the fra fabric of the communion at the deepest level. And that phrase has come back again and again. And so what we're seeing is an unraveling, a pulling apart of a, of, of a fabric. Uh, and that's, you know, that's not a sort of immediate thing. It's, it's all the strands one by one uh, are, are being dis, disentangled. Um, and um, so there isn't going to be an overnight split. Um, but I think we are going to see more uh, uh, intentional uh, work now between uh, the different groups, particularly GAFCON and the other group, the GSFA, which, as I said, they worked, they're working together um, 
to establish um, an Anglicanism, global Anglicanism on the biblical lines and to essentially exclude um, the liberal the liberal churches from from that process. So that so is is the Church of England or well be or the 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 you know most of the ninety percent of the bishops in the Church of England disfellowship from global anarchism from this point effectively. Well, they would say no, of course not. They would say they're not, and Welby will continue to travel around the world, and people will be polite to him. But there's a there's a spiritual break that's happened now, um, you know, and um, it, it's going to be un uncomfortable. I would counsel the people not to receive him. I would count. I would honestly. I mean, well, some some will, of course, and that that will happen. Some people will say, actually, we don't. We're cancelling the visit. Um, other times people will say, well, we're, treat, we're treating this man as, a, as a, you know, in terms of his status, but actually we can't spiritually, we're not in fellowship with him. And it will be the same with, with, other, with other links with, with, the church, with the Church of England. Now, the big question, of course, is what do faithful Anglicans within the Church of England do now? Um, and maybe you're, you're coming on to that. I don't know, but but I mean that. You're, go go, yeah, go on to it now. Go on to it now. Yes, go on. Yeah, what, well, I mean, what, what, is... your, what would your counsel be then, Andrew? For yeah, there are there are probably vicars watching this. There are, are certainly um, members of Anglican uh, con congregations, church meeting congregations um, watching this. What would you? What would your counsel be? What would you say to them? Well, I, I think um, a number of things. Firstly. Um, don't focus just on individual events like the synod, the February synod or the July synod, um, and and ask how that it, these local events or these events in time are affecting my local congregation. We all need to expand our vision to global gospel mission, which and setting out God's agenda for human flourishing and how we're going to do that locally and how we're going to be part of the glo God's global agenda for doing that. Um, I, I would say that if you're excited by Kigali last, last week, either as a participant or as someone watching online or whatever, um, but now in the cold light of day, you're tempted to pull back from breaking, for example, breaking spiritual fellowship with your bishop or uh, whatever you, action you've decided to take. Hold your nerve because there's going to be um, pressure to essentially fall into line back to where you were before. I think um, there are people who are who want to dismiss GAFCON and to divide GAFCON and GSFA, the Global South uh, Fellowship, um, which is the other organization working closely with GAFCON. Um, actually, they're working together. So don't think you can dismiss GAFCON and hold on to the other one and think it's more respectable, uh, more easy to control from our point of view. Actually, no, the, the, um, the authority, the spiritual authority has now passed from, from England. And that's not just the, the Church of England, the Archbishop of Canterbury. It's from, from the big evangelical churches here. We need to see that actually we are now a small part of a global movement. And we need to see how we can contribute to that rather than just saying we're still in charge and, and, and they can come and help us in our agenda. So I would say that. Um, and I would say, do you have a plan B? Um, uh, so I'm someone who I was in the Church of England. We came out of the Church of England. We were able to, uh, with GAFCON's help, establish the new uh, Anglican network in Europe, uh, which is a new jurisdiction under GAFCON that's outside the Church of England. Um, and uh, uh, that's been a great privilege. Um, are people in the Church of England aware of that? Do you have a plan B? Have you got Have you got various scenarios? Or are you just hoping for the best, that everything will be sorted out somehow and that you'll be able to carry on as you are? Uh, but be be in a safe space where your beliefs are not being compromised. I, I just think uh, people need to be realistic about that. And then lastly, this is a time for spiritual warfare. This is a time for uh, praying together, looking, at being aware of Satan's tricks and how he's going to try and disrupt, how he's going to try and divide us. Uh, we need to be aware of that and um, uh, 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 get onto that as well. Uh, humbly um, bring these things to him regularly in prayer. That's um, excellent, excellent advice, Andrew. Um, I've got one more question for you, though, which is um, how if, if people hearing you today are thinking, oh, I didn't know this or I didn't know about this group and so on, how can they make contact with you or how or who should they be making contact with in order to connect with you and like minded people on this kind of stuff? Uh, yeah, well, do go to GAFCON GB, uh, GAFCON GBE, uh, GAFCON Great Britain and Europe, 
that is uh, uh, bringing together people in the different jurisdictions under the GAFCON umbrella. Then there's anglicannetwork.org. That's the Anglican Network in Europe, um, which is the group that's come out of the Church of England or is outside um, uh, and uh, operating in different ways. But that's a developing group. So we, you can definitely contact through either of those. Right. Great. Very good. And uh, final comments from you on how you see the implications of this and what it will mean for the Church of England? Um, well, first of all, I want to say thank you to Andrew and thank you for Andrew's lifelong uh, faithfulness. Uh, I have watched him now over many years be faithful within Anglicanism, with both nationally and internationally. And I'm so pleased that you had that role uh, in the Kigali statement, which I, I think is absolutely pivotal um, for, for what happens next. I think perhaps I want to see rather than this unraveling of fabric, I kind of see it as a pruning, <laughs> a pruning of a plant uh, where that which that which has been uh, un, 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 faithless, that which has been disloyal is being cut off from the true branch, the true vine. The, the true vine is there. It was the... the it was there in Kigali. That was the, that was true Anglicanism. That is the movement. And I want to say to people, have courage, because that's what the gospel brings. The gospel brings that courage. It brings that joy. It brings those words. We love our Church of England. We want we want to love our bishops so much that we will say, beware, repent before it is too late. Speak truth, because you know that even at this 11th hour, if you speak truth, House of Bishops, if you declare God's truth, that in uh, Colossians also says in Jesus Christ, all truth holds together, every single bit of it, House of Bishops, if you declare that truth, then you will see a miracle unfold in our nation. It may not be too late because as we know from the Bible, as we know from the Bible, God is so patient, so much more patient than Andrea for sure, because I felt very impatient about this for a, quite a long time. And there is, a, there is just this truth um, that still they could repent. And our job is to call out, to, to, to speak the truth. But for those that, uh, for for those that are within Anglicanism, then when your moment comes, and the, I think the moment has come, but you need to have the courage to speak and act in truth. So you cannot, you cannot do fellowship with bishops that do not uphold the word of God, that do not uphold uh, the sanctity of marriage, that do not uphold being made in God's image, Gen Genesis 1, that do not uphold Christ's unique claims to be the son of God. I mean, Ironically, during Kigali, we had cathedrals celebrating Iftar, hosting Iftar. I mean, we, 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 we cannot do that kind of communion. It is time to speak and to proclaim. You know, the theme, uh, I know that the Bible studies were in Colossians, but the theme of Kigali was also uh, that sentence from John 6, the, the phrase from, from Jesus from John's, John 6. He has just fed 5,000 with loaves and fishes. He has just walked on water. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the, the, he who is above all things and in whom all truth holds together. He's just done these things and still people reject him. And still people reject him. And so, and, um, Jesus is speaking to many and many desert him. Many that should have seen these things, many that know him, many that should know better, many that are in positions close to him, um, who know him, desert him. Um, and it, we're told from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Can you imagine being Jesus? Can you imagine what that must feel like? Well, I think we get a bit of it when we look at our Church of England. You know, many deserted him. How can they desert him when he's just walked on water and fed 5,000? How can they desert him when they you know that they know that he is beautiful and the king? And then you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Can you imagine that, Jesus? Saying that. And... 
Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. And so what I say in response to all of this, those people in Kigali were saying, in this context, in their context, across the world, um, Lord, who shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe that you, oh God, that you are the, that you, Jesus, are the Holy One of God. What a privilege to know that. You know, how much courage does it require to just really live that? Let's do it. Great. Well, listen, I think that was very insightful, very helpful. Thank you so much for joining us, Andrew, and look forward to watching and hearing and, and seeing how this um, all develops. But um, what a powerful statement there that came out. Thanks to some of you. Oh, thank you so there. much for that. Uh, Amazing, Andrew. And, uh, Amazing. Andrew is on the faculty of the Wolf Force Academy, did a brilliant session last year on um, cultural Marxism. That I think under applications for that closed this week, this weekend, I think. Um, so if you know somebody or you will think you're applying yourself, do apply um, that in September this year and um, look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone for joining. Thanks for your comments.